Hare Krishna, Vaisheshika Prabhu. Thank you very much for joining for the Monks Podcast once again. And this is doubly auspicious because you know you have we are setting a global record in terms of the Bhagavatam distribution in terms of Bhadra Purnima. So I am grateful that you are here to talk about that. And for me also, this is the 200th Monks Podcast. So it's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. I Krishna Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. I'm happy to be here with a real monk <laughs> and for the 200th, which is your style is to be prolific in all, in all ways at, with deep content. So it's it's my honor to be here. Thank you, Bhavi. So, true. last time we, we had discussed on a similar occasion about a year ago, at that time we had focused more on the the whole idea of community development through book distribution. Uh, this time you have this, uh, that was one of the most inspiring podcasts in terms of how systematically and uh, thoroughly well thought the outreach is. And uh, so now today, I thought we could discuss more about the Save Earth campaign, which you which you have pioneered as a, on the occasion of the Bhadra Purnima. So can you tell something about how you came up with the title of Save Earth specifically and how the, how you see it related with the distribution of the Bhagavatam? Oh, sure. <clears throat> well, years ago, in the 1960s, there was a an article in the Village Voice in New York when Srila Prabhupada had first started his Sankirtan movement. And uh, the title of the article was Save Earth Now. And it was related to Srila Prabhupada starting the Sankirtan movement. So I took that same title, thinking it appropriate at this particular time in history, since there's a way in which people feel a little frustrated that uh, the climate, the political situation, interpersonal relationships seem to be a little strained. And I'm perhaps being a little mild in, in that statement. And that they would uh, really like to help in some way. So we're offering this as an entryway into really doing something to help the world. Mm, okay, yes, I remember it. also that posted that say work now. Yes. That is true. So that's beautiful. It's remarkable how even last time you also mentioned about the Bhadra Purnima, the distribution of Bhagavatam. There are there are significant details mentioned within our own tradition, within our own Guru Sadhu Shastra, but sometimes they're not sufficiently highlighted. So I appreciate how you highlighted Bhadra Purnima and now you have highlighted this theme saver now from Prabhupada's times. Wonderful. Yes, Prabhupada. So yes, the world is, you can say at one level, the world is always going to be having troubles, but we do see that the troubles seem to be escalating. The world seems to be just careering from one disaster to another. We have come out of the pandemic, but now there is war and inflation and stagflation and a lot of things going on which are quite ominous. So how do you uh, see the Bhagavatam as a um, uh, uh, a solution to the problem of problems of the earth. Yes. Well, within the Bhagavatam, there are several references, numerous in fact, that describe the process of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and allowing other people to hear it as medicinal. And uh, the word remedy is also used in the Sanskrit word shikitsitam, which means that when there's an ailment, uh, we would like to have the cure. That's quite natural. And in a systemic way, we need a systemic cure. That is something that, that is highly effective from the inside out. And the premise of the Bhagavatam is that when we purify our inside, then the way we deal with the outer world then also becomes balanced and proper. And the Srimad Bhagavatam then is a sound vibration that's now made portable because it's in writing that can be distributed to others who, when they hear the sound vibration, discover uh, ways of living that help to improve their consciousness and also that uh, solve various psychological anomalies that 
happen to come up due to our interaction with the very complex material nature that we deal with as souls. And, it, and in this way, one by one, uh, people who develop an enlightened engagement with the world through uh, purifying their own consciousness then start to have a, an effect on, on other people. And how else would we be able to do it except for one person at a time and then one community at a time and then that by extension, going out to the entire world. Mm, yes. There's a quote of Srila Prabhupada also where he says that there is no use of crying for world peace unless there is an awakening of divine consciousness in the individual. So I think what you're saying is the Bhagavatam is transporting, is, is raising people's consciousness. And in that way, it is going to help in bring out world peace. Yes. So, yes. Uh, yes, true. So now we could say that three things. First is uh, broadly, say, inspiring devotees itself to distribute a whole set. And second is uh, that itself is a challenge. And distributing one book is difficult, a whole set, maybe it's even more difficult. I'm amazed at how many sets have been distributed. But I'll just outline it and then you can elaborate. Uh, it, second is that persuading people who know about the Bhagavatam, say probably Indians, Hindus, who have some reverence toward the Bhagavatam, inspire them to take a full set. And those who don't know anything about the Bhagavatam, I think it, inspiring them to take a full book, full set would be quite a challenge. So any thoughts about how, how these challenges are being met and how you are, in, you are guiding, encouraging, inspiring in that direction? Oh, certainly. Paradoxically, it seems that the selling a whole set is perhaps easier than one book. And here's why. Oh, okay. When we present the whole Bhagavatam as an encyclopedic, encyclopedic presentation of spiritual knowledge, both to those who are unfamiliar with the culture of the Bhagavat, uh, it's much appreciated. In fact, people relate it to the world-famous Encyclopedia Britannica, which is a must-have. Every family I know before the digital age, I saw that indeed my family and everyone, everyone I knew in my neighborhood had an Encyclopedia Britannica. After all, why would you deprive your children of the opportunity to have all the knowledge in the world at their fingertips? And when people unacquainted with the culture of, of uh, the Vedas and, and the extensive writings are presented with a package that includes as we would tell them, all the knowledge of self-realization, they feel it to be reasonable and that they, they think they should have it. And for those who are from the Indian culture, who are familiar with the various kinds of shastras and, and wisdom literatures, uh, they also uh, appreciate the fact that having the comprehensive presentation with all the explanations that come through analogies and metaphors and stories is really important for them so that they can imbibe their own culture and inculcate that same culture into their family, especially their children. Mm, that's interesting. So it just, it, it's, it feels like they're getting something substantial and uh, that's true. So this comparing with the encyclopedia is also a very thoughtful idea. Uh, and uh, does the Bhagavatam seem too alien a literature? Or how do we present it so that uh, actually people feel inspired? Like Encyclopedia Britannica is a very well-known, respected name. But I'm not sure whether the Bhagavatam is, is that, that, to that extent. We find that Westerners love it. Those who are inclined to spiritual knowledge are, have a resistance to sectarianism. And therefore, one of the first statements of the Bhagavatam, which is that this completely rejects all religious activities that are materially motivated and propounds the highest truth, which is reality, distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. This immediately catches their attention. There are so many brilliant non-sectarian statements that people resonate with. For instance, in the Sri Japanishad, which reflects the same kind of statements, Prabhupada writes in a, in a purport that all forms of incompleteness are due to incomplete knowledge of the complete whole. 
when people hear these commonsensical statements from the Srimad Bhagavatam and the other Vedic literatures, they immediately gravitate towards it because they feel like here's something finally where we're being given a straightforward truth without any of the um, sectarian overtones that it take this or you're doomed forever, that type of, of mood. And uh, people really relate to the culture in which people would work on themselves. And that's much uh, presented in the Bhagavatam, that it starts with you. And that if you can purify your consciousness, then you'll see the world in a different way and you'll interact with it in a different way. All these very basic concepts that, concepts that pervade the Bhagavatam are extremely attractive to people in the West. It's amazing. Now that I think about it, the many times when I give talks to Western audiences, there are some who are interested in basically self-help kind of content. And then I try to present from a very basic perspective. But there are a good number of people, especially in the yoga studios and other places, where they actually want not just generic wisdom, but more, we could say, specifically source wisdom. So I gave a class on mindfulness once and one person asked, your talk was very good, but how much was it actually based on the Bhagavad Gita? So that was a very interesting question. I thought that, uh, that as people in the tradition, we want to keep our content based on the scripture. But even in they are actually interested, not just in general wisdom, but they're interested in... Um, in knowing, learning books from particular, learning about particular wisdom texts from particular traditions also. Is that your observation also too? Yes, very much so. And I'm glad you brought it up because there's a way in which in any tradition, one can become jaded. A jade is an old horse that doesn't want to run anymore because it's run so many races. So there's this danger of Niyamagraha of becoming so used to your own tradition that number one, you might think that um, it's it's common. And the other one that uh, is that you might think that it's it's not translatable to an outside audience or those who lack the context. However, as you're pointing out, people often push us, those who are in the tradition, who are presenting it, to tell them more specific information about the Bhagavatam. And when we see their impetus, uh, we realize what a, a, a treasure we have, because oftentimes people very much gravitate towards the uncommon stories, the otherworldly stories that are there within the Bhagavatam, the pictures, the ideas of variety within the spiritual world. And when we see that in them, we realize more of the value of the Srimad Bhagavatam for ourselves. But I do find that, that oftentimes uh, when we're, we're trying to pull back a little bit as to not offend anybody's sensibilities or sense of, sec uh, of being allergic to sectarianism, People often push us and say, no, no, you tell me more. I want to know <laughs> the details here. I think you're holding something back. Mm, that's true. So, so actually, there is this, if we, that we want to share wisdom, then it's like an ocean that is available for us to share. And uh, just continuing that point, I was also thinking of uh, wisdom of the sages where you have also appeared in times. It's amazing how they are able to speak directly the Bhagavatam, take the Bhagavatam verses and reach out to a large number of uh, people who are not been introduced to Bhakti directly, but Bhagavatam becomes their first introduction to Bhakti. Yes, and I think it's a matter of uh, trusting those who are presenting it. When you feel a sense of wholeness uh, in the people and goodwill, the goodwill that they're presenting, you, you see it for yourself that uh, they're not expecting anything in return, but actually they're presenting in such a way that we can take advantage of it. Uh, human beings, or I should say sentient beings by definition, are sensitive, and they can feel when there's goodwill being presented. And then they uh, naturally gravitate towards those who are speaking it, and then the message goes in quite easily. And of course, the Bhagavatam is, is very accommodating. It, it addresses us in such a way that we feel like it's a friendly voice. It's actually trying to help us. 
And it's it's so the voice of the Bhagavatam is so aware of our plight here in the material world that it's uncanny. And I think people resonate with that too. When we hear the Bhagavatam, it's almost like looking in a mirror and realizing the various types of psychological challenges that we have. And then we hear that voice when we say, oh, this book understands me, it knows me better than myself. And that that experience, I think, impels people to want to go deeper into it and want to listen to more. Mm. So when you say this book understands me better, knows me better, mm, can you give further elaboration? Because at one level, there can be a lot that can seem unfamiliar in the Bhagavatam. I understand what you're coming from. But... Uh, uh, okay. How how does that? It's like how does that book help us to know ourselves better? Well, I'll give a couple of examples. There's a story of Urvashi and Purarava, and yeah. in it, there's this very intense codependent type of situation that most people can relate to. Uh, everyone's had some type of situation, or most people, I should say, have had some kind of. Uh, complications in a relationship uh, that uh, yet they can't give it up because they're so attached. That's a, a very commonplace uh, psychological condition in the material world. And when people hear that story, they think, yeah, I, I recognize that. <laughs> On the other side of the spectrum, you have Rishabhadeva, who, who gives these uh, very uh, terse statements about how real happiness comes through sacrifice. It doesn't come through trying to get more comfort in the world. And it, it may sound a little harsh at first to the ear, but it, it does make sense to us because we know deep inside that when we are able to delay gratification, when we're able to apply ourselves to a discipline, and uh, then we actually start to feel fulfilled and happy. So there are various ways in which the Bhagavatam just fits and it, the, the concepts in it uh, meet our expectations of what we want in a spiritual literature. Mm, that's beautifully put. What we want in the spiritual literature is not so much just information, but we want uh, something that can help us transform ourselves and if we can learn some values and principles. So, that's so true. Yeah, I would say also, uh, just a few more thoughts on that. We yeah. recognize the attitudes of, of various saints in the Bhagavatam. For instance, you have Dhruva Maharaj, and I would epitomize his attitude as, I'll show them. My mother used to say, never underestimate them. the power of I'll show them. And then, uh, you know, you get Bharat Maharaj, who leaves his meditation practice and, and becomes attached to a deer. And that ep epitomizes a, a particular a situation that we often find ourselves in, or sometimes do, in this world where we say, I'll never do that again. If you get me out of this one, I'll be good from now on. <laughs> and we can go through the iconic figures of, of the Bhagavatam and relate to various attitudes or situations we've been in our lives and see that, oh yeah, this is talking to me. Mm. So, it, have you made a list of this? This is amazing. Hey, Kyle, yeah, actually, I did. I, I did a talk recently called the uh, something the attitudes of the Bhagavatam. It, it's it's something I'm developing right now, actually. But I'm trying to find the iconic figures, and I so far I presented five of them in a class. Uh, but I'm uh, cataloging more of them and bringing them more into the vernacular understanding of what is. Uh, what is it that we say when we're in these situations and how it relates to those characters? Okay. So it's, a, it's beautiful. There's in Western psychology, Carl Jung talked about archetypes. It's a complex concept, but it is ultimate, it's somewhat similar that there are fundamental structures of thought and uh, that underlie human consciousness. So yeah, I will show them. That's uh, so true. And that I will show them is is directed <laughs> constructively in the case of Dhru Maharaj. But in the case of people who become demoniac, it is, I'll show them gets directed destructively. So we can say Hiranyakashipu also has that same mentality. But 
you know, he says, I will show the world that I can, I how powerful I am, how much austerity I can perform. But anyway, this is fascinating. You know, so now when you just, um, I would love to see more of Muni's presentations. This is probably one way we can, we can not so much universalize the Bhagavatam wisdom as, as reveal or make accessible the universality of the Bhagavatam wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, that's so important. I love that you said uh, basic structures of thought. I think I forget exactly how you put it, but yeah. and and accessibility. I was speaking to a Radhika Raman Prabhu, the, the scholar, religious yeah. history and so forth, and he was pointing out to me that philosophers generally first a philosophy has to have grandeur. It has to be out of our reach, as as Robert Browning once said. Uh, you know, our our goal must exceed our reach, otherwise, what's a heaven for? And then there's then he says, at the same time, it has to be accessible. Because if you can't reach it ever, it's so far a reach, then that philosophy is discounted entirely. It's 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 not worth anything. Why even pursue it? So the Bhagavatam makes these two aspects of philosophy come to life. One is the, the absolute uh, wonderment of the of the spiritual world and the spiritual science and at the same time the idea that any person kirata hunanda pulinda pulukasha could access it uh, from their position by starting where the bhagavatam uh, leads us in uh, that we're all going to die and there's something we can do about it mm, true so there are you said two things that it has to be bigger than our present worldview or bigger. First part, Robert Browning, you put it. What was that part? I sorry, I missed that particular sentence. It has to be some wonderment, some grandeur. It's beyond okay. our reach, yeah. seemingly. Yes, that's true. Wonderful. And the Bhagavatam has both. It's true. It is, it is accessible also once we get into it. And uh, so when we talk about Going back to the topic of save earth now. So you you said that sharing the Bhagavatam is easier because it's like encyclopedia and it is relatable. So even for people who have no familiarity with the Bhagavatam, uh, how much have you, are there any uh, stories of, or an, uh, incidents of entirely new people getting Bhagavatam and starting to read them and becoming inspired in their spirituality or becoming inspired to apply its principles? Yes. And it's happening now all over the world. This uh, attempt, people, devotees made this attempt years ago in the 70s to uh, reach the uh, non-Indian audience, those who are unacquainted with, with uh, Vedic culture, by selling sets. There was some effort here in the Bay Area, and then uh, in Australia there was a devotee who put a lot of effort into that. And there were seemingly very few breakthroughs in that. And it was fairly recently that we started figuring out that, first of all, there were a lot of people who already knew Vedic culture who would take the Bhagavatam if we presented it in the right way. And then uh, we started having breakthroughs. And these are happening all over the world now, where people are accepting the whole Bhagavatam as a must read. and that is on the basis of the encyclopedic presentation of self-realization. And the books themselves are very attractive. I mean, human, humans love books. They always have. And when they see attractive books that seem to have the values that they're trying to attain, it's hard for them to resist, actually. So when we take the books out into public venues and show them and just explain in simple terms showing some of the stories through the pictures and the books, then people will say, yes, uh, let me take this. And I guess the ones who are taking them uh, become transformed. They, they take them into their home, which is a statement unto itself that, you know, I'm embracing something because so sociologists tell us that the things that we keep in our home, especially prominently placed, are... Uh, indicative of, of, you know, what we're trying to project to the world. 
<laughs> so it's a, the big decision for people is if I put this in my, my house, then I'm saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a spiritual type of person. And uh, we're hearing stories from various people who took the books into their home, and then they started by moving other things out of their life and, and reforming their habits, like starting to uh, become vegetarians, and then starting to practice bhakti yoga in their homes. And this is due to the presence of the Bhagavatam. Oh, okay. So is there any newsletter or some place where devotees who would feel inspired to distribute books can share stories? Like in the past, we had the World Sankirtan newsletter. Do you have anything specifically for the Madhura campaign or for Bhagavatam distribution? Or it's included in the overall book distribution uh, inspiration? Yes, we have a, a website called distributebooks.com. And there we put together all the latest best and the best practices. And we have a, a WhatsApp group. There's one of them that's uh, in North America for those who are interested in pursuing uh, book distribution. And uh, that you can get in touch with um, our department or marketing communications and innovations department called the mci uh, from the bhaktivedanta book trust and um, we have we have links to that that uh, shamahini can give you that uh, your listeners can connect to and very specifically for bhadra purnima we have a wealth of uh, information that uh, people can um can uh, download like exactly how to present the Bhagavatam. We also have uh, people, con uh, those who are teachers, who will contact you or your team and give you a tutorial of how to do it. And we found that to be very successful. Mm, that's amazing. So can you, since you brought this subject up, can you share a little bit more about how the coordination is being managed globally for something as big as this? It's uh, ultimately, I think it's individual devotees all over the world who must be doing according to their inspiration. But still, there seems to be a significant level of coordination also. Yes, that's correct. So on every continent, and the way we look at it is we have seven continents and each is a palette upon which we can express our devotional service, especially through book distribution. And and each continent has uh, various leaders that we stay in touch with. And then there are sub leaders, and there's a hierarchy that goes out uh, into the um, various levels of, of management and then to, into the congregations and so forth. And we regularly meet with these leaders and coordinate with them the, the global goals that we have. For instance, for Bhadra Purnima, we have a goal this year of distributing 43,000 sets of Srimad Bhagavatams, at least. Mm -hmm. Last year, we did 35,000. So this year, we're going to increase by 23%. And that keeps us on track for our five-year goal, that by 2026, we'll have the capacity worldwide to distribute at least 100,000 sets of Srimad Bhagavatams collectively as a global team. So we start by thinking of the global team that we're all in this together. And then we have the individual continents, which are uh, looked over by GBCs. And then there are uh, regional managers and temple presidents. And then there's the Sankirtan leaders. So for the, uh, for the executive branch, we ask that they oversee this, they kind of look at the maps where we show how their continent is doing, how their zonal areas are doing, and we ask them to do one thing, and that is to advocate. We love the word advocate because it has the word vok in it, which means to speak. And so all they have to do is just say, this is a good idea, you should do it. <laughs> and once they say that, it frees up everybody else who's in there area to say, okay, let's do it. Let's coordinate this. And then it's just a matter of um, deciding what kind of pledge they'll use. And we have this saying that your pledge is your wedge. 
So a wedge is the most useful tool in human society, it has a small end and a big end. And here's the amount we ask people to pledge, something more than zero and not less than one. Because as soon as you make a pledge, I'll distribute at least one set of Srimad Bhagavatams for Bhajra Purnima. Then you'll notice that because of that pledge, the spiritual energy starts to enter, not with not only within your own mind, but also uh, within the community. And then when you realize that you're an agent and that Lord Chaitanya will empower you to distribute that one set, then you'll think, well, why don't we make a pledge for three or seven or 17 or 55? And we've had this experience in various smaller niche communities around the world that they started by saying, I don't think we can do anything. We've never done it before. We don't know how to do this. And then we said, well, just make a pledge, something more than zero and not less than one. And say, okay, we'll do one. And like in Hong Kong, they said that. And then uh, next thing, they called us back and said, guess what? We did three. And they said, we've upped our goal to 17. And then it kept climbing and climbing. And then we find that there's this uh, stream of spiritual energy coming to their community. And it's coming from Lord Chaitanya. So we also have a saying, assume it can be done, that we realized during the pandemic. And that is the only thing that holds us back from uh, increasing our capacity to distribute Srimad Bhagavatam is our attitude. And you can preempt the attitude that blocks all growth. And that attitude is that uh, you have a list of excuses why it can't be done. And oftentimes when you say, well, how about distribute a set of Bhagavatams? Someone could give you two pages of, of a list of two pages that say, mm -hmm. here's why we couldn't do it. So we say instead, and this is our motto, we have merch and everything that says this, aprons, bags, buttons, assume it can be done. If you start with that, because Lord Chaitanya is doing it, we're not doing it, then it opens up this universal intelligence that's coming from Krishna. And last thing I'll say about that is that in 1975, and we went to Prabhupada in Vrindavan, our Sankirtan leaders, to ask Prabhupada how we should teach people how to distribute books. And Prabhupada said, teach them to be sincere. And then he went like this with his hand. He said, because the master within the heart will show them how to do it. Mm. That's beautiful. So when you say, just a couple of thoughts, your pledge is your wedge. Wedge means, are you saying that like a tool for getting inside where it's difficult to like to pry open something? So to pry open our will, yeah, you, the wedge you are using in what sense? Mm -hmm. That's right. Think of it like initiation. You make a vow that I'm going to chant 16 rounds. That's your entry level. That's your wedge to get you into the spiritual world. Like who let you in? Well, they just opened the door a crack for me and I got in. <laughs> I got in with my pledge. So we can enter so many uh, areas that seem to be out of our reach just by using the thinnest end of the wedge, the thinnest, the smallest little pledge that comes from our heart that by Krishna's grace, I'd like to do this. And as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Swalpam apyasadharmasya trayate mahatobayat, that's the most useful kind of prayer is something active. Let me do something for you. And when you do it, even if it's su alpam or the smallest razor thin, in fact, even better if it's razor thin, because then it, it, it gives you better entryway, then you're safe from the most dangerous type of fear and you'll make progress. Mm, that's beautiful. In one sense, this is a practical way. We can say, yena kena prakarena manakushinivesha, somehow or the other, that's not just like arbitrary or random. I mean, somehow we have to find our wedge inside. And what you are providing is various various resources or various pathways, various ways in which people can get their wedge. We always do, as then you can start off, both sharing the, reading the Bhagavata, both distributing the Bhagavatam and eventually reading the Bhagavatam also. Yeah, well, think about how Prabhupada did it. His Bhagavatam was his wedge. He didn't bring anything else. He brought the Bhagavatam and, and they asked him at customs, you know, are you going to sell all these? And he said, no, no, they're gifts. And then he got in and the rest of it expanded based on that beginning Bhagavatam. 
distribution. And then think about also the pages in the Bhagavatam. I think about this often, Chechen Sharan Prabhu. So when I'm reading the Bhagavatam, it looks like a long literature, and it is. It's 18,000 verses. It can be a little intimidating. How thin is a page? How thin is one page? It's so thin you can't even measure it. Good luck measuring one page, the width of one page, right? And so then you might think, like, how am I going to actually get through one part of this, one chapter, if the pages are so thin? It's almost like Zeno's law, that Greek philosopher who said you can't go anywhere because you have to have to go halfway first, and there's an infinite number of halfway spaces. <laughs> so the answer is by just being methodical. And if you just do one page at a time, then you're going to get through the whole Bhagavatam. And what more can you do in your life? And it's the same way with reading as it is with the distribution of the Bhagavatam. Just make a small presentation and find out where it takes you and do another one after that. And the world changes. It opens up because of the wedge principle. Mm -hmm. Amazing. The world changes, the world opens up. This is amazing. So, when uh, we talk about, uh, so the wedge was one thing you mentioned, and the another point you mentioned was also that for people when they uh, when they start off, we assume it can be done. That is also a very interesting way. So, in one sense, uh, there is this uh, there is this uh, paradox where at one level we say that the world is dukkhalaya, it's a place of distress. And the Bhagavatam also is spoken in, a, in, in the shadow of death. Parishit Mahaj is going to die. But at the mm. same time, despite both of these, death and distress being unavoidable, it, it seems that there is abundant room or even, even you could say necessity for a, for a positive or optimistic attitude and not a pessimistic attitude. So how do, how, how do you see this? Because we can also say that it's Kali Yuga and things are going to dark enough. So, assume it can be done. How, do, how does a devotee philosophically ground this optimism and not just see that as, as say, like motivational self-help alone? Well, again, it's attitude, which is expressed in the Bhagavatam itself. The quintessential verse which directs our attitude is in the 10th canto. Tatenu kampam susamikshamano unjana evat makritam vivakam. That if we maintain this optimism about the world that it's a friendly environment, it's trying to inform me, it's trying to purify me, then whatever obstacle we come against, we actually find it to be uh, uh, helpful. And this is the logic of the forest fire. Recently, I was in the forest and uh, with a close friend, and, and we stopped along the way to read some of the placards in this uh, national monument, which has red, redwoods in it. And on one of the placards, uh, there was a description of how uh, forest fires, which uh, occur regularly in, in, the, in the forest uh, due to lightning strikes, are so good for the forest. And one might think, oh, that, that the fire is bad. But actually, it opens up the canopy and lets in more light. It burns off a lot of the duff, this uh, collection of uh, debris on the ground that comes from trees and other plants. And it invite and that becomes nutrient rich, and then it, many more animals come in. In fact, the indigenous people there, uh, the Miwok uh, tribe, used to have uh, their own controlled burns because they realized the benefit of fire in the forest. So when we have fire in our lives, actually, you might review your life and see that the times when you were most challenged are the times when you actually dug the deepest, and you got your deepest realizations that have guided your life since then. So the Bhagavatam works on that principle. Yes, it's Dukhalayam, it's a place of misery, but what do those do for us? What do they tell us? What do they inform us about ourselves? And if we have the idea that um, assume it can be done because we're being guided by a higher power, then our life becomes really exciting. And that's the optimism of the Bhagavatam. That's what it teaches us. Mm. I had always thought of this verse as a verse of submissiveness, humility, tolerance. But within that, there is optimism also. That actually there is there's the mercy of the Lord that is the, 
there's a bigger reality apart from the or apart or be, apart from or beyond the misery of the world and in that sense because the mercy is a higher principle so there is there is always the uh, the not in as a potential but even the because there is responsibility to be positive mm. well i like that the responsibility to be positive that's really good <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes so actually you know a, a a great leader once told me when i was seeking counsel your first duty as a as a leader is to be blissful he said if you're blissful then you can overcome all other obstacles and other people will want to follow you and if you're not blissful then what can be done mm, that's amazing i i was also talking with one devotee and again property seven so we chant hari krishna and be happy they're not that's not necessarily one instruction they're two instructions <laughs> <laughs> so, bravo be happy is also instruction yes true <laughs> <laughs> that's great mm. so now uh, when we see this uh, as is international coordination and devotees can see who all are doing in which parts of the world so do you see some parts of the world which are more receptive and some parts of the world are uh, less uh, receptive one factor would be of course how many devotees we have in that part of the world and that will also determine how many how many can distribute but are there any things about the about the broader receptivity to bhakti wisdom and krishna consciousness that can be seen through the global uh, global bhagavad distribution yes one thing we can notice is the universality of spiritual seekers we find them everywhere in every culture and when we go to cultures that have it as their the base of their society sometimes as i mentioned before they could take it for granted and they feel that i already know this because i grew up in it and therefore they might not be so interested in going into the details of it because they feel like oh yeah i i kind of know all about this even though they haven't looked at it in detail uh we find that every every culture is slightly different but that there are seekers within every culture and you can never count people out is that's one of the lessons to learn in presenting the bhagavatam to people is don't assume that they somebody's disqualified because we hear stories all the time people say oh i met this guy and he didn't look like the type in fact i was just in toronto and a devotee was telling me that someone came over to the table it was parma garanga was telling me he said somebody came over to their table where they were presenting and he thought well this guy looks really conservative and he was elderly and you know he'll probably be uh closed minded but it turned out that he was the most receptive of all the people that day that he met and this is another revelation that devotees have is that uh the the impetus for spiritual life uh is there within people all over the world and you just have to keep presenting to find out who they are it's like a, a process of selecting ripe fruits from a tree you have to feel them and and you know test it does it come off easily from the tree and so forth it's one of the great mysteries of sankirtan of going out into the the great unknown known as the public and presenting spiritual knowledge and it's the most enlivening also because when we find that a uh, spiritual spark within people that we thought to be unqualified uh, we ourselves remember how universal it is and also seeing their enthusiasm we also become reenthused so vicariously we're experiencing uh, what we felt the first time we came in contact with the bhagavatam through the eyes of those who are newcomers mm yeah and this is something which uh, i have also not only experienced but shared after in the initial years of our spiritual life we can see that the transformation within us is quite 
dramatic and rapid but after some time the transformation within us uh, starts becoming a little subtler and at least seemingly slower so i what i have found is that if we want to continue our in, being inspired and motivated in our bhakti it we can't always be looking for only our transformation it is when we see others getting transformed and that we had some part in helping them transform i think the inspiration from that come which comes is a remarkable so what you are saying is exactly when it's not it that when we see the bhag we start valuing more when we see how it's benefiting others because sometimes that benefit is much more easily tangible for than it is for us immediately i have a story about that that's a little illustrative that yes. i was taking a group of devotees door to door in north carolina mm. and we came to a door where a man was physically and perhaps mentally handicapped and he had a caretaker the caretaker was averse to our presence there but the but the man had this intense desire to know what we had to say and he wanted the book the caretaker tried to force him to give it back but he wouldn't let go and then when we asked for the donation she became even more vehemently opposed but he again insisted and he brought back a donation then i asked him to chant the ma mantra which was an obvious strain to him because it was hard for him to move his vocal cords in the right in the, in in a normal way and therefore we could see his neck was straining and it was hard for him to enunciate but nonetheless he went through the whole mantra with great strain and after the door closed i turned around and i had seven devotees with me and they were all visibly moved several of them had tears in their eyes and i said what are you feeling and they said this person had so much enthusiasm to chant and to take the book i wish i had that they he they said he's better than we are and i want to be like him from now on and they they were um affected as you mentioned by by this experience of of meeting the raw enthusiasm of a newcomer who and and then remembering that that's actually what drives spiritual life is that enthusiasm it's beautiful it's a uh, there are you know, in one sense we do say that we rely on shabda praman but still when something comes pratyaksha to us when we see that something uh, some transformation is happening at a level that is perceivable for us that does have a deep impact mm -hmm. I yeah i like to say nothing succeeds like success yeah and it, we see it when we actually note it for ourselves that we're better than we were before by hearing the bhagavatam then there's this a uh, kind of greed to take more of it because when we know something's in our real self interest we tend to gravitate towards it yes true so when you earlier talked about the universality of the bhagavatam irrespective of whichever culture or whichever area people are from and uh, when we um, when we when we are devotees are distributing is it that uh, in some parts of the world the enthusiasm is more or some parts my i'm asking this is not to just create dissensions but we know that our movement is flourishing in some parts of the world and it is we are having challenges in some parts of the world like india it is flourishing from russia also it's flourishing quite well in some western parts of the world uh, we are growing but not necessarily reaching out to people from diverse backgrounds in these parts of the world so do you see bhagavatam distribution going in parallel with the way our movements outreach is happening or Is it is it extending the envelope beyond? Mm. I see it as a as a necessary ingredient for anyone from any culture to make advancement in spiritual life, and as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mentioned to Sanatan Goswami in describing sixty four limbs of devotional service, and then. essentializing them into five and saying that these five 
practices out of the 64 are so important and potent that even if you don't have faith in them, but you're not offensive and you have a little contact with them, you're going to make advancement. In fact, you'll reach the goal through this. And one of them is hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, the association of, of like-minded devotees who are more advanced than oneself. And having this as part of the mix that we present to people is vital. In fact, our community here at ISV is founded on the principle of these five, that because people don't have a lot of time in certain cultures because of the economic conditions, that, that is, they have to work really hard to pay for the, for the mortgage and everything else. And then they have families and so forth. However, if they can keep in touch with these five, one of which is the daily hearing of the Srimad Bhagavatam, they're going to make rapid spiritual advancement. And so it, it, it should be expertly interjected into whatever forum one is presenting. You brought up Wisdom of the Sages earlier, and Kosh Duba Prabhu and Raghunath Prabhu are dedicated to the Bhagavatam, and that's exactly how they've grown their community, which is overflowing now with people who are eager to advance in spiritual life. And it is the uh, fulfillment of the prophecy that Srila Prabhupada made when he was on the Jaladuta and wrote about how important the Bhagavatam is. In fact, that was the wedge. As I mentioned before, he he quoted from the Bhagavatam itself, starting with Shru Shru Shro Shadadhanasya, then Srinvatam Swakata Krishna, saying that if someone can just be in an environment where the Bhagavatam is being spoken and hear it even a little bit, then they're going to make spiritual advancement. So it's vital ingredient is always present whenever you find people making spiritual advancement. So we should emphasize it. In every culture, Kirata, Hunanda, Pulinda, Pul, Kasha, Peter, Shumba, Yavana, Kasadaya, Shukadev saying, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter how far away from, from the Varnashram system you are, you're still going to be purified, Prabhavishnava, Namaha, because of the power of Lord Vishnu coming through the Bhagavad. So it's the way you're putting it, it's, it's uh, both for our community development as well as our, for outreach. Bhagavatam is an essential part, yes. And so it's one of the five limbs of devotional service. And uh, so, do you see that the, the Prabhupada, one of his concerns was that we, we distribute his books, but we don't read his books? Do you see a correlation that if devotees read the Bhagavatam regularly, that inspires them more to distribute it also? Or distributing it inspires them to read it. Is there some kind of uh, synergy or cyclicity in that? Yeah, lo lovely word, synergy. And I like the example that I found in Jamuna's famous cookbook, the Cuisine of India, or whatever it's called. And it's it's again encyclopedic <laughs> cookbook. And in the section on rice, I found uh, the, the scientific evidence for combining rice and dal and, and that therefore making a, um, a superfood. So rice is a good food, it's a world staple. Dal is a good food, but when you put together the two of them, you get a superfood. So similarly, distribution of Srimad Bhagavatam is high sadhana. Hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam is high sadhana, but when you put them together and you do both, you get the super sadhana. And that's what she said, you get 42% more nutrition when you put the two together. So in the same way, if you want the most beneficial practice in your life, then read Bhagavat, distribute Bhagavat. Those two make super sadhana. Mm. It's beautiful, but so both in both employed. That's the it's, in fact, probably as you know, you know, we we have a system, and it's an app available for Android and for the iOS. It's free on the internet. You look it up. It's called Be a Sage, page by page. Yes, and this app, the, the best yeah. resource I have seen online for actually <laughs> studying the Prabhupada book systematically. I don't think there's anything else which comes anywhere close to it. Also, now it's amazing. Oh, thanks, Prabhu. That really is heartening. I did it for myself because, you know, I'd look at the Bhagavatam and all the Prabhupada's books and sometimes have this feeling like, how could I possibly read all those? I'm so busy. 
And then I heard Brian Tracy say, anything you want to do, you break it into small slices, and then you can do anything. And I thought, yes, that's it. The Bhagavatam has a finite number of pages. How about if I count the pages? So Srivast Pandit volunteered, count all the pages in each one of Prabhupada's books, and then we set up a chart. And we were able then to calculate how long will it take you to finish the Bhagavatam in one year? How many pages would you have to read each day to finish the Bhagavatam? An example, one for example, one year. That that I wanted to know first. Could I finish it in one year? Is it humanly possible? Answer is absolutely possible. It's only 41 pages, which takes an average of one one hour and three minutes a day average to read at a regular speed going through the Bhagavatam to read 41 pages. Could you do that? Yeah, possible. But if you don't have that much time, then do it in five years. It's only eight pages. So then if you get on a regimen like that, then you're taking this um, tonic every day. And that's what Bhagavatam is a tonic. It's like everyone wants some Ayurvedic medicine. It's like, give me something to take. <laughs> I want to feel I want to feel young again. Well, the Bhagavatam really does that. You're taking that tonic every day and it makes you strong. It makes you spiritually aware and uh, uh, it revitalizes us every single day. Mm. So what's happening is that it's uh, <coughs> it's uh, two things happen. First is it becomes accessible. It seems doable. It's, it's eight pages, a finite number of pages seems doable. And then as we do it, we see not only that I can do it, but actually it's tangibly en enriching me. It's en strengthening me. It's benefiting me. And then it becomes it becomes further motivation. That's good. That that's a remarkable way of looking at it. Also, thank you for sharing that. And uh, you mentioned earlier maybe a couple of uh, final questions. Uh, so, are there ways in which uh, those who receive the Bhagavatam sets they can be connected with some some further resources online for their growth? Maybe uh, like an introductory course on the Bhagavatam because the Bhagavatam classes daily are going on all over the world, but to some extent, they are a little bit for the insiders. Mm. Yes, Prabhu. It's, it's for the first this... time when Wisdom of Sages started, I had not really thought of the Bhagavatam as a tool for, as a means for outreach. I'm not even sure whether this has been done in, the, in our tradition in the past. Because in that sense, it's remarkable. But it does seem there's a huge amount of potential. So any, any thoughts about that? Uh, absolutely. In fact, it's on the forefront of our minds. It has been for some time. And fortunately, uh, during the pandemic, we were able to marry the two together. The two means book distribution, distribution of Bhagavatam, and having a community that people could enter at an entry level and uh, then uh, stair-step their way up to thriving in devotional service. And uh, we're finding and that the that devotees have thought of this in many places around the world, and they have programs in London. Uh, there are programs here at ISV that we started that are now being used in various countries around the world because it's franchisable. Our pro program is called uh, Bhakti Community. And as an example, when we announce Sankirtan scores, we also uh, combinedly talk about how many people came into the Bhakti Community. And when devotees go out to present Bhagavatam, they're also finding those who are most interested and then inviting them to come into the community. And at that level, we present it at, at the level that's appropriate for each person who enters so that they can then feel part of a devotional community that suits them, it has the right habitat for them to survive, and then uh, come up to the level of actually wanting to distribute Bhagavatam. And we're, we're finding this cycle again and again that people come in to these uh, programs and then they get um they're they're naturally part of the community and then their next impetus is how can i give this to others because it was given to them in the same way they want to give back hmm. but when they give back they can give it do it in a more accessible way i mean and the way that whoever they are giving it back to they can make it accessible for that particular audience yeah absolutely and we've we find that those who are recipients of the Bhagavatam and who have 
how it's changed their life, they want to give it to other people because they know that's how they came is through these uh, the the revelation of receiving Bhagavatam and then coming into the association of devotees. So it's quite natural for them to present the same thing to others. Mm. True. And on one last point, this is that sometimes uh, when we when we set goals, for some people it can seem a little bit uh, little bit non-spiritual. The idea of setting targets and having deadlines, and people come to spirituality for being peaceful, serene, and uh, sometimes external goals can create a lot of stress also. So, how important is it to set goals, and how do we ensure that the pursuit of the goals doesn't uh, make us too externalized in our spirituality, rating our success by externals alone? Well, scientific studies have shown that people are most peaceful when they're pursuing a worthy goal. This is just a fact psychologically. Mm. So that's a given. And then uh, as far as goals, those can always be adjusted. We're, we're self-imposing uh, goals on ourselves all the time for what it makes of us to achieve them. And therefore, uh, we're at liberty to adjust the goals appropriately. Therefore, uh, when, when I introduce Bhagavatam distribution in a new community. I tell people, we're not going out to sell books. We're just going out to touch the pavement. You go out and you touch the pavement in the place where we're going to distribute them and you're done for the day. That's your only goal, is to feel what it's like to walk out past the threshold of your doorway and go out into the great unknown. How does that feel to you? Once people have that experience and then they get a little bit of traction by being outside, they want goals. They want numerical goals. And we've tried that here at ISV. We normally have a quarterly certain kinds of goals. And then when we tried one quarter to give everyone a break for a little while, no goal, everyone complained. They said, come on, that's no fun. So goals are, are there so that we have something to reach for. You know, as you give that example, you go to the gym and then you just move your arms around. You don't measure, is it a 35-pound weight or a 45-pound weight? A man signs up for the gym and then says, oh, it's too much trouble to lift the weights. I'll just move my arms. And then what's that? Nothing. So we want something that puts a little pressure on us. Pressure is where we grow. Pressure is where diamonds are made. And uh, this is the substance of life. Now, if you put it in a spiritual context, then you make spiritual advancement, interestingly, when you have a little bit of spiritual stress, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Material stress is bad, but spiritual stress, working towards a spiritual goal, actually purifies you and allows you to develop more capacity. And that's what we want. I just say that, you know, this Bhadra campaign is based on a verse from the 12th canto of the Bhagavatam that says, when you give the gift of Srimad Bhagavatam to somebody else on the full moon day in the month of Bhadra, you get the return gift of going back home, back to Godhead. Therefore, we're, we're advocating that everyone get involved in the campaign. They can come to www.bhadracampaign.com and they can get all the information, but give at least one set of Bhagavatams away uh, for the Bhadra Purnima. We're having a grand... Uh, uh, fire ceremony to announce the results of all the Bhajra distribution and pledges in in Tirupati, India. It will be televised world or, or on the web, live streamed worldwide. And everyone can do something. Get involved and uh, get, get your community involved and start with a wedge. Something more than zero and not less than one. That's beautiful. That's so doable. Thank you so much. This is everybody can get involved. And it was very stimulating discussing it at how, first of all, the Bhagavatam is so it's it's filled with wisdom that the world needs. And it's individual transformation that can actually transform the world eventually. And the Bhagavatam is meant for raising individual consciousness. And this is our tradition's legacy, our tradition's contribution to the world, which we should not be withholding back. The people are seeking it. And as or the, for Shila, like your pledges, your way, so you talked about various ways in which you can be optimistic and start off from zero to one. How Shila Prabhupada considered this the central pivot for his outreach and how we can not only 
in uh, the Sud Bhagavatam, but have a tangible program by which we can read books ourselves. And uh, it's an essential part of our sadhana, essential part of our outreach. And this last point which you mentioned about that peace comes not just by having a peaceful environment, but actually it comes by having more of a purposeful life, have a purpose in our life. And Bhagavatam gives us a great purpose. And uh, the synergy of the external and internal, these are amazing points. Thank you so much for sharing. And yes, I'm sure that many of devotees will feel inspired to do whatever they can. In hey, Tanya Charm Prabhu, it's such an honor to be on your show. I find you to be the most brilliant presenter, the most thoughtful devotee. And uh, I, I love how you're consistent every single day in putting the message out for thousands, tens of thousands of people, perhaps millions now around the world. I thank you for, for walking the earth and for being such a, um, a, a, a cooperative community person. You're always trying to help everybody else come up. It's a really an honor. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Thank and you. And to all your audience. Your kind word. I see them as blessings of Shla Prabhupada. And Thank you. I see that uh, I'm, I'm privileged to have your association and your words of encouragement. The more I travel across the world, the more I see how much your influence is there, not just among devotees who are directly inspired by you and taking shelter of you, but also everyone who is distributing books. They're all over the world, in, in, in India, in Europe, in Australia, in America, in, in Canada, everywhere. So I'm happy to be a small instrument for continuing or expanding what you're doing. Thank you for coming on this podcast. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I look forward to Go it. Go Hare Krishna. Go Hare Krishna. Go Hare Krishna. Go Hare Krishna.